On your Thursday episode of Locked on Raptors, can the Toronto Raptors roll out a better bench than they had last season? The good news there is the bar is on the floor. You are Locked on Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Thursday, August the 15th, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the Hell website at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can join us in the Locked On Raptors Discord server where we broke our, I think, like month-long streak of not talking about the Jakob Pertle trade in there. Thanks, Ben Chapman. Uh, if you want to come and yell at Ben for bringing that one back out of the closet, you can go and do that by joining the Discord. It's free to do. With The link is in the description of the podcast. We would love to see you in there of course you can follow subscribe rate review on the audio side of things to whatever podcast app you choose find locked on raptors do the things that ask you to do to support the podcast you like it's much appreciated when you do that you can also find us on youtube subscribe to the youtube channel hit the notification bell and you will get a push notification every single time the show is set to premiere or go live which is a beautiful thing today's episode is brought to you by fanduel make every moment more and all summer long fanduel is hooking up customers with a boost or a bonus daily that's right there's something for everyone every day all summer long visit fanduel.com to get started and we will get started here on your thursday edition of the show mid-august talking about the season to come digging into the toronto raptors bench we talked about the starters and the sort of core group of guys on the team last week talked a lot about the rookies earlier this week who will probably figure into part of the conversation today and we're going to dig into the bench and how it should be constructed which guys should be part of the main rotation can it be better than what the raptors rolled out off the bench last season some lineup combos we like vets versus rookies all of that we're going to dive into with our pal from raptors republic the god of the game recap it's jamar hines jamar how are you my friend I'm doing good. Uh, no game recaps anytime soon. Once again, I'm on a little bit of a break, but we are with uh, we have basketball basically for the rest of time. Honestly, yeah. WNBA comes back today. The mm-hmm. last possible date of the WNBA finals is two days before the NBA regular season begins. So I'm in basketball blitz for till I like the horizons just filled with <laughs> basketball. <laughs> uh the horizons filled with basketball a couple months we'll be reading your sweet sweet game recaps over at raptors republic again it's very very exciting times uh and yeah let, let's get into the bench and the sort of reserve crew that you'll be talking about surely in these recaps to come down the line uh just a refresher if you didn't recall last year the toronto raptors bench uh sucked it was really bad uh they never really had a sort of set unit they went with uh the closest thing to it was various amalgamations of four players off the bench plus scotty barnes the numbers for those not exactly inspiring over 829 possessions last season of scotty barnes plus four bench guys you know no siakam no og no iq no rj or yak on the floor the court sort of main starters uh minus 13.6 net rating an eighth percentile offensive rating not great bob uh obviously they did not really produce a ton of scoring punch off the bench they finished the season 18th in bench points per game but that's a little misleading because down the stretch of the season they were uh, in tank mode and you know jordan wara was popping off at the odd 25 off the bench here and there meant nothing before scotty barnes and yaka pertle got hurt in the first week of march the raptors were 24th in bench scoring per game so all around not great from the second unit for the Toronto Raptors. My question to you, Jamar, there's been some change. There's going to be guys who kind of carry over who came in in the back part of last season. Do the Toronto Raptors stand a chance of having a better reserve crew this season than they had in 2023-24? Honestly, I think it's going to be a little bit of a challenge as unfortunate as that sounds, because Mm -hmm. for as bad as the Raptors bench was last season, there were points where, when Dennis Schroeder finally went to the bench, he mm-hmm. did a pretty good job of leading said bench. They don't really have a bonafide six man like that right now. And if you're 
probably going to start Grady Dick. That seems to be the consensus idea, at least right mm-hmm. now. That would hurt the bench production even more because Grady can do some things, can score a little bit, and if he's going to be the fifth starter, it's like, yeah, it's probably probably going to, at least to begin the season, I could see something really inconsistent bench-wise. Mm-hmm. And then maybe guys kind of get used to a role as the season goes along. But might get worse before it gets better, basically. Yeah, I, I think there's like the outline of a better second unit here, but I'm glad you brought up Dennis Schroeder because I was going through and sort of preparing for this podcast. I haven't really thought about Dennis Schroeder in a non-Olympic context for a very long time. You know, I, I didn't love the Dennis Schroeder experience last season in Toronto, but he was undeniably very good off the bench during the stretch after the acquisition of Emmanuel quickly when he took over as the starter, having like one of the three to five best backup point guards in the league on your team was real nice for second unit steadiness and production and having a direction with those lineups. Schroeder was able to kind of tap back into his on ball defense stuff that he wasn't able to, when he was playing like 35 minutes a game and running possessions more or less every time down the floor. Uh, and you know, I, I'm now sitting here thinking, huh, it would be nice if they had Dennis Schroeder to roll out and, and didn't trade him away for literally nothing at the trade deadline. Um, you know, I, I understand like the personality reasons and, and the sort of the, the sort of chemistry stuff that was wrong with Schroeder. I, I get that all, but I also think that points to them maybe sort of setting ridiculous expectations for Schroeder, bringing him in as the only point guard on the team and being like, run with it, buddy. And then changing his role mid season. That feels like a mismanagement of a guy who is probably a backup at his best and not really starter worthy on most NBA teams. And so, yeah, I, I'm a little bit uh, sort of peeved that that trade happened now in hindsight, as we look at a roster that doesn't really have a clear backup point guard. Now, a guy who could become a backup point guard for this team, and maybe that's what they envisioned for him, is Davion Mitchell. Uh, he is new. He is going to be part of the bench crew. One would think he's going to play heavy minutes, I, I, I'm guessing, uh, as one of those reserve guys, the defense he brings to the table as, a, as an ISO guy, individual on-ball guy. All that stuff's very nice, and that's going to play very nicely on a team that needs defensive punch. But can he run offense? Can he guide the ship? That's going to be a big one. And I also think the way they figure out how to stagger Emmanuel quickly and Scotty Barnes is going to tell a lot here too. Because I do think there's a world in which quickly can be sort of that second unit sort of guy, like sort of Kyle Lowry plus bench, but the new version of it. Uh, but what does that do to the starters when there aren't other guards to go in and fill in his void when he is playing with the bench and maybe being the first sub out? Uh, what? How do you sort of look at the backup point guard situation between Mitchell, between maybe Jamal Shedd at some point, uh, quickly and Barnes kind of staggering in there? Like, is there anything that gives you hope in there? Yeah, I feel the Raptors are going to have to do a, quite a bit of quickly slash Scotty staggering because I don't think there's a scenario where you don't want you you want both guys off the court. Like I feel mm-hmm. like one out of two, just from a playmaking perspective, should always be on the court. One hundred percent. So that's that's definitely going to be an issue. I I I'm pretty sure you'll see some of those Scotty run minutes where he's even running the point off the bet uh, with the bench lineup. And you know you mentioned Davion Mitchell, but he might be an off guard. I mean, off ball guard in those situations. So, yeah, as, as the season goes along, we'll again they'll find some roles probably where guys get, are better suited. But to begin the season, Shed's probably going to be in the G League. Mm-hmm. Um, it's gonna it's gonna be a lot of Scotty and quickly. So you know, hopefully they stay healthy. Or otherwise, the, those bench lineups could get pretty dicey. They very much could, and I do think we'll probably see a lot of like two starters plus three bench guys just to right. have a little bit more stability. We'll get into some of that coming up. I do think, earnestly, like quickly Pirtle as a backbone for second units could have a lot of legs. It makes a lot of sense to kind of run their pick and roll as your base play and have guys playing off of that. Filling in those gaps is a little bit interesting as far as how they actually do that. We'll get into some lineup combinations and all that. And there is a guy we haven't talked about yet who has moonlighted as a backup point guard in the past and might be the sort of clear answer that's just sitting there in all of our faces. Bruce Brown, he's part of the vet crew. We're going to talk about the veterans and rookies and sort of finding the right balance with the second unit coming up 
in just one second. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, the single best place to go wager on sports, if that is your kind of thing. And yeah, in the summertime, the sports schedule is a little bit lighter. But as Jamar mentioned earlier, the WNBA season picking back up today. You can throw some money down on the rookie of the year race between Caitlin Clark and a- Angel Reese, if that's your thing. Or you can just make a, a bet on who's going to win the whole damn thing. You can also do that for futures for the NFL. College football, of course, kicking up very soon here, too. It's not going to be long until the sports schedule is very full. And, you know, I'm not someone who wagers a ton, but I do like a futures bet from time to time, mostly just to prove that I can see the future. And I love being right when I get a futures bet. Correct. I've done that for the Denver Nuggets in the past when they won the championship and felt very, very good about the odds I got. You can go peruse the futures. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball and the Locked On Podcast Network. Back at it here, talking second units with our pal, Jamar Hines, who, of course, is part of our starting unit of guests on this here podcast. A reminder, uh, you can go check out the starting five of host combinations over on Locked on NBA as well, our daily NBA show, talking about all the goings on all offseason long, looking ahead to the new season, win total predictions and all that stuff. It's there, Locked on NBA, every single day covering your favorite teams and favorite league. It's uh, Go make it your second listen. Do it, okay? All right, let's get back to it here. Jamar, the bench, talked about the vets a little bit, uh, and let's dive in a little bit more here. Bruce Brown, not necessarily a point guard, but not necessarily in anything. He's just a Bruce Brown. He can kind of do a little bit of everything, and he has had flourishes in the past where he's been sort of a nominal backup point guard. And that was, I think, essentially what his role was in those Scotty benched units last season when they played together. Um, You know, they didn't use him much as like a screen and dive guy, much to my chagrin. I hope they do that more this season. Um, But that was sort of the most used bench combo last year was Brown, Abaji, uh, Scotty Barnes, Grady Dick, Kelly Olynyk. That lineup did not do very well. Uh, They got run off the floor again, minus 13.6 net rating overall. Um, Sorry, it was much worse than that. I have have it here. Minus 19.3 net rating. So even worse, a second percentile defense for that group. The offense could not get going. Uh, and so maybe Bruce Brown as the backup point guard is not exactly tickling your fancy when I read you off those numbers, but uh, I think the skill set he has to be sort of a table-setting backup guard is probably more there than it is with a Mitchell or a Shed just yet, and maybe he just gets the job by default. And that brings me to the question of veterans versus youth in the second unit. They kind of have these sort of group of vets, Kelly Olenek, Bruce Brown, Chris Boucher, question mark, Bruno Fernando, question mark, then they had these sort of older vets, sorry, younger vets who are sort of second draft guys, Davion Mitchell, Ochai Abaji. And then there's the rookie crew, Jacoby Walter, uh, Jamal Shedd, Jonathan Mobo. These feel like the guys who are going to soak up the lion's share of bench minutes this season. Um, what would your sort of preferred balance of youth versus veteran savvy be in these second units? And does that evolve maybe over the course of the season, Jamar? I think that is something that evolves over the course of the season. Obviously, development is still at a premium here. Um, mm-hmm. So you want to see a little bit of uh, Walter and Mobo sprinkled in. You probably have more vets to begin the season. I think, well, it depends. I think a lot of it depends on how the Raptors, like what the Raptors record is as the season sure. goes along. Obviously, if they're losing more, you're going to see more of those younger players play as the season goes along. But if they're actually, you know, in contention for a play-in spot, a playoff spot, which would surprise me a little bit, then you would see them a little bit less. Like a guy like Walter would probably have less rope and we might be complaining in February how come he hasn't played as much. So, yeah, I feel like it's a very fluid situation depending on how the Raptors do until that point. And I would – Obviously, I would like to see a couple of them sprinkled in, even to begin the se- begin the um, season. But you know, it's like the Grady situation last year. If he's not playing a lot, why not just send him down? Right. So that wouldn't surprise me either. Where Grady spent quite a significant amount of time in the G League. So yeah, I feel like there's going to be a lot of back and forth. Uh, you 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 mentioned Boucher. I think he's probably the biggest question mark because 
there were long stretches where he did not play uh, mm-hmm. last season. And it was asked about a ton. Darko was asked about it a ton. And when he was playing, he didn't look that bad. It's just he just wasn't in the rotation period. So I think when it comes to vets, he's probably the biggest question mark more than anybody because obviously they're going to find, they're going to try and find a way to get some of their young guys in. But mm-hmm. Boucher's kind of like the odd man out. He's not young, he's not particularly old, but he's. I mean, he is not... like the oldest guy on the team at this point, minus really? Kelly, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's like 31, 30? 32 this year. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah, I was thinking 30, which I mean, I didn't think that was that old, but I guess when you compare it to everybody else, I guess, I guess he is the. Uh, I guess, I guess so. Stephen, if you will, yeah. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. That doesn't make me feel great, considering I'm older than 30, 31. But whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm at the point where there's one guy on the team older than me, and it's uh, doesn't. I mean, actually, two. Garrett Temple's still around. So, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. Um. So yeah, we, we, don't worry. We're not dead yet, Jamar. It's soon. It's coming <laughs> fast, but we're not dead yet. Um. <laughs> yeah, Boucher is interesting. I I just think for me. I'm fine with them kind of rolling vet heavy early on. And I know yeah, that it, it oh, makes it's sense. development season. You got to play the rookies. You got to get them the development time. You can't have vets standing in their way. Like how many times we got over this, like where you can't just play four rookies, right? Like you can't play this many young dudes and expect to play coherent basketball. It's not how it works. I think Jacoby Walter, Jamal Shedd in particular, are probably going to get a lot of 905 time. Uh, we know Ulrich Shamshe is going to be down there probably most of the season, if not all of it. Um, we'll get to Jonathan Mobo, who I think is interesting just because when you try to piece together these second units, I'm always finding myself like, it'd be nice if there was like a six, seven wing guy with some defense I could throw in here. And he might be the only guy on the roster off the bench who sort of fits that mold. So he's interesting, but I think I'm fine rolling with Brown and Olinick and Davion Mitchell. Obviously I think there's a, you know, important sort of information to gather on him as to whether or not he's guy who's going to be around long-term. Um, I'm less enthused about heavy Ochai Abaji minutes, frankly. And I think yeah. summer league really kind of soured me on that whole experience. Not that I was sweetened on the experience before. Um, but like, I think Olenek Brown are certainly part of the rotation. I think Boucher, like before he got hurt last year to end his season, he had like a week of looking pretty good next to Olenek in front court, front court situations. And it's not perfect, but against second units, I think you can get by with those guys in the front court. He helps with the offensive rebounding. He helps a little bit with the defensive rebounding issues that Olenek brings with him when he's on the floor too. So I think there's a role there for Boucher somewhere. And I think Fernando, if he's going to be on the team, uh, which he still has to make the team, he's got a non-guaranteed deal until he makes the team. But I do think defense and rebounding are two things he totally brings to the table. And there's a world in which he becomes sort of what, uh, sort of like a beefier version of what Chris Boucher can be in those front courts next to Olenek and I think there's a pathway for him to have a role too and so I'm not seeing a ton of room for those young guys to sort of have obvious roles from day one you know Jacoby Walter shooters are always in style movement shooting is always a valuable thing so maybe he figures into some rotations we'll talk about that a little bit here coming up too but let me just ask you this like if you had to guess your first four guys off the bench in terms of just minutes played for the Raptors this coming season, you know, guys six through nine, if we're sort of assuming a nine man rotation, who okay. would those guys be sitting here on August 15th? One, Kelly Olenek, two, Bruce Brown, three, Davion Mitchell, four, uh, four, four, four. I, I think, I think <laughs> me, after you get past eight, it, 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 it's a real toss up. Yeah. I, Ochai in my mind, but I feel like I feel like it, he's trending downwards. So mm-hmm. I don't know about that. If if Walter really impresses, maybe he can slot in there. Uh, if Boucher can find a role, maybe he slots in there. It's really a wild card after eight. I, I think yeah. I know the I think I know the first three, but after you get past the eighth man, yeah, it could be anybody really. I will predict it today. That it's Jonathan Mobo who gets the, okay. the fourth most minutes off the bench. Just again, like the need for a guy of his size and length is going to be, I think, pretty dire in these second units. Um, and, you know, I think Bruno Fernando could figure in if he makes the team to be in that ninth man conversation, too. Maybe he's a bit more of a, a sort of sparing guy you toss in for 10 minutes a night and he's like your 10th man type of thing. Um, but yeah, I think Mobo is easily the most likely rookie to sort of get regular rotation run. He's older. He's a little more physically mature. 
I think he kind of does more connective stuff. And, uh, you know, Walter could figure in there. Shed could could figure in there by the end of the season. But I think Shed's more of a, a second year type thing um, than anything else. But yeah, it's uh, look, it's not great. Look, I'm not. I'm also not saying that they should roll at Garrett Temple and go full old man. Like I think they should try to sprinkle in the young guys where they can. Injuries obviously happen if Grady Dick or R.J. Barrett gets hurt. Jacoby right. Walter is going to slide in to fill some of those minutes, right? Like we right. we always sort of undervalue the uh, prevalence of injuries when it's August and we're just sort of imagining the roster. So there will be minutes for all these guys at some point. I just think the most reliable guy you can bank on getting minutes is Mobo just because nobody fits his physical dimensions on the team and his set of physical dimensions, pretty important in the modern NBA. We're going to come back on the other side, Jamar rounded out with a look at some lineup combos. We would like to see the Raptors roll out in the second unit. The rules here we will establish, but three bench guys at minimum up to five. If we want to get real crazy with it, we'll get into that coming up in just one second. All right, wrapping things up here on Locked On Raptors for your Thursday. Uh, sending you off into the weekend with this episode. This will be the last show of the week. If you want to go back, check out yesterday's show with Oren Weisfeld putting a bow on Canada at the Olympics. Tuesday, Katie Heindel was on the show. We talked about the rookies on the team and where they'll all fit in. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, we'll get into more off season -y stuff next week as well. The return of Big V, et cetera, et cetera. All right, segment three. Lineup combos we like. Lineup combos we kind of imagined among the second unit. Again, the rules here. Got to have at least three guys we project to be reserves on this team. We're going in just sort of assuming Grady Dick's going to be the starter. It's not, you know, we're not beholden to that. If Jamar has a different opinion than me, that's also totally fine. But seems like consensus. And I think Bobby Webster has even sort of alluded to this in his sort of, excuse me, in, in his pressers and stuff like that. That Grady's probably going to be that fifth starter which I think is fine. I think it works. I think the geometry of the floor makes a lot of sense with him out there. He offsets and, and sort of provides spacing and gravity, et cetera, et cetera. So got to be at least three guys we think are going to be reserves. You can sprinkle in two starters. Let's just go back and forth for a few minutes here with some lineups we got and reasons why we like them. What you got for your first lineup you want to see off the bench, Jamar? Okay, I'll start with my practical lineup that I could actually see happening because the other ones are kind of ridiculous. So, <laughs> so for, we it's August. About, Let's get crazy, baby. <clears throat> um, some of this we've already covered, so it falls in line with that. We've talked about Scotty and quickly put, uh, potentially staggering. So either one could lead this lineup. It, and either one, I guess, would, would probably be at the point. But the other guys in this lineup would be Grady would be the second starter, then Bruce Brown, and then your big combo would be, as we mentioned, Kelly Olenek and Chris Boucher, because I feel like they complement each other pretty well. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be the way that Boucher finds a role on the team he, with the rebounding, the rim protection a little bit. Um, he could even shoot the occasional three. We saw a lot of Kelly and Grady synergy last season where they I, they played really well off each other in a couple months uh, left in the season. And then Bruce Brown, you know, he could have some secondary playmaking on, on this uh, lineup as well. And then, yeah, it's Scotty or quickly sh shoulder run. I feel like this would be a particularly great lineup for Grady, not only because Olenek is there, but with Bruce mm -hmm. Brown and with Quickly or Scotty, you basically have three guys who could kind of play make and get you the ball. I feel like it would be a great way to get Grady some open looks. Um, if Grady was hurt, this is also a lineup that potentially Jacoby Walter can slide it slot into. Sure. Um, you know, because a lot of what Jama was working with uh, Walter on in summer league was catch and shoot. He likes mm -hmm. to use his pump fake, but he would like him to just catch and shoot right away if he has the space to do so. So with the defense focusing on three other guys, you know, even some cutting could be put into this with, you know, Scotty or Olenek doing some high post stuff. So I just feel like it, offensively it's a pretty versatile lineup and it's probably a great one to generate some shots for a young guy like Grady or Walter. So and to get Boucher in there. So that would probably be my most practical lineup. Yeah, I, I have Scotty, Grady, Boucher, Brown, and Olenek as one of my lineups. If okay. we're going to try the Scotty and four bench guys thing again, which like I'm not super keen on, but if we're going to do it again, I think that's probably the lineup that has the best shot. I, I think 
Um, just the the mix of you have the shooting for Olenek and Grady Dick. You have, uh, I think you could open up and sort of use Bruce Brown as that short roll guy with Kelly Olenek spaced out as the stretch four. Um, sort of on offense, you know, Boucher sort of crashing the glass, you know, cre- creeping baseline for cuts, things like that. Um, I, I think there is like some offensive synergy you can find yeah. with those guys that makes some sense defensively probably struggles because i think any lineup where kelly olenic is the biggest player is going to struggle but you do have scotty's help defense out there you do have chris boucher and his sort of athleticism and shop blocking and um just sort of his frantic energy the offensive rebounding that he brings to the table like i i think there's something there i'm actually surprised that that lineup got no run together last year. I tried to pull it up on cleaning the glass thinking, oh, there was like a week where they played together. No, they never played minutes together last season. So mm. that lineup was not part of the horrible numbers that Scotty plus four bench guys put up last year. Uh, so maybe this one will work. huh? Um, my first lineup here does not feature Scotty Barnes. It goes back to what I talked about earlier in the show of using the quickly purtle duo as kind of the backbone for a second unit. It's got Emmanuel Quickly, Davion Mitchell, Jacoby Walter, Kelly Olynyk, and Jakob Pertl. Uh, so okay. you get the defense from Mitchell at the point of attack. You have Jakob Pertl as the defensive anchor. You know, you're not forcing Kelly Olynyk to be the smallest guy or biggest guy on the floor protecting the rim. Jacoby Walter, I just put him in there for the shooting. I think I prefer that to Ochai Abaji. He was probably the other candidate for this lineup. Uh, and you can just kind of run basic spread pick and roll. If Davion Mitchell can hit 36% of his threes like he did last year, that's functional. If Jacoby Walter can fly around and, you know, offer some decent defense at the point of attack, which, you know, I think is going to take a long time for him to really come along there, but might as well throw him to the fire this season with a lineup where he does have rim protection behind him in the form of Pirtle. It's got functional size in the front court with Olinick and Pirtle both being around seven feet tall. Um, and again, I think quickly Pirtle just as a base duo is going to be pretty successful and, and win a lot of their minutes. So, that is my first pitch as a lineup I would like to see. Obviously, we didn't see this lineup last year because two of the guys were not on the team. Um, but thoughts on that uh, that that fivesome that I've just pitched out there, Jamar? I like it. Uh, and you yeah, mentioning mentioning Proto, I believe that helps with with quick with quickly, right? So mm-hmm. I, I feel like. They didn't get to play a lot last season because obviously as soon as quickly got to the team, essentially Pirtle couldn't stay on the court, unfortunately. So mm-hmm. I feel like there's a lot that could be tapped there. Um, even Pirtle running some stuff in a, a high post because he's a underrated totally. passer as well. So Quickly and like, Walter flying around, yeah. Exactly. So I like that lineup. Yeah, uh, just for reference, there were 19 possessions of quickly Olenek and Pirtle sharing the floor last season. Uh, they were a minus 68.4 <laughs> oh. differential, so not good, but oh. 19 okay. possessions, so a, a non-existent sample. So yeah. again, uh, you know, so c- clean slate. Let's see what they got. Uh, what's another lineup you got? We got time for maybe a one crazy lineup for each of us. What you got? Okay, if we want to do a crazy lineup, which I think... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not gonna it's not gonna provide you winning basketball, but it would just be. It, it, this is basically the uh, summer league lineup where you have Shed, Walter, Grady, Mobo, and Shamche. <laughs> just go all, <laughs> just, just go all young. If it's like it, you know some random game where maybe they've fallen off the map or something like that, and it's like hell, you know what? Let's just play all our young players in some sort of lineup mm. and see how it goes. I mean, I I think people would enjoy that a little bit. Again, it wouldn't lead to much winning. It wouldn't be a great lineup, but it would be a way to get all the young players on the court. Um, Another one I had in mind that I'm kind of struggling with is um, you. Maybe you can help me on this. Sure. What would be the best defensive lineup using three bench players? Now, obviously, Mitchell comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Um, Does Abaji come to mind? Like he kind of comes to mind, but also I don't outside know. of loves, though I don't even know if I want that. Um, yeah, I feel like that that have to be a lineup where Scotty kind of has to be in just to kind of anchor things a little bit. Maybe your guy Mobo gets some run there. I'm That's my feel, thought. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking of, like you could go Davion Mitchell as your backup point guard. Okay, you could roll out. Jacoby Walter for some shooting. I, I think probably a better defender than Grady Dick, even from day one. 
Uh, I think you roll out Mobo as your three. So that's you roll good. out Scotty and Yak, or is that? Yeah, that's that's, 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 that's yeah, that's, that's three the, bench guys, two starters. Like that fits the criteria. It's not perfect. The spacing will be pretty. Yeah, tough. that's like, <laughs> we're going for defense. And right, so, like, right. Mobo, Scotty, and Yak is a three, four, five. Okay, you can talk me into that defensively. I, I can get on board there. Um, no you know, they, they could be one of those lineups that wins their yeah. their their stretches like four to three over nine minutes or whatever. Uh, <laughs> um one last one i had so i had another sort of silly young guy one where it was shed okay. dick walter barnes and mobo so like you okay. put barnes out there you try him with four bench guys but they're new fresh fun bench guys and uh you, you get to see what he kind of looks like with the future um I, I think there's something there and the other one i have is quickly brown rj barrett who we've not talked about here is like a stagger right. option quickly right. brown barrett olinick and jonathan mobo is a small ball five uh i think you get relatively decent spacing there it's like a, a, a decently sized lineup it's not huge but it's not teensy tiny you get the quickly mobo sort of short roll two-man game that i think is really gonna be an interesting sort of thing going forward for this team maybe not just this year or maybe not this year like all the time but in years to come um and again you have mobo and olinic as your front court mobo can be your nominal five on defense Olinic uh is able to sort of space it out and, and you know do his elbow creation stuff while Mobo can kind of work more on the interior. Um, I think those guys should play a lot of minutes together just to see what you have in those two as sort of a combination of skills. And then Brown and Barrett just for sort of sort of decent three-point shooting, maybe not that teams are gonna care about, but uh that they can at least knock them down when they come to them. That was another one. But yeah, the more I think well, about these lineups, Jamar, I'm not super thrilled about what they're gonna be. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, so with that lineup, especially a Linux presence is very important because with the tendency RJ has to barrel himself into the paint, yeah. which has been, uh, which has been a very good thing that has worked out for him since he's totally. gone to the Raptors, you totally need someone to space the floor and the front court there. So eh, we'll see well, overall though, <laughs> we're going to have to be patient with the benches. I, I think is where we're getting at because it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna take some time. It's gonna take some development. It's gonna take some patience. It's gonna take some synergy to, you know, figure out what works and what doesn't. I think that is very well put, and I think that is a perfect place to leave this show off. Jamar, thanks so much for hanging out, buddy. You got anything you want to promote for the good people out there? Absolutely zilch, nada, nothing. <laughs> I am doing nothing. Uh, this is like me in June slash July until the Olympics started. I am completely free. I am just going to be watching basketball like most of you and enjoying it until Raptors preseason begins next. I was about to say next month, not not next month. Yeah, like I guess just under two October. months away. We're okay. we're getting close. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 closer than you think. Closer than you yeah. think. It'll fly by. Um, we'll leave it there. Uh, find me on the Hell website at Woodley Sean, Instagram, Locked On Raptors. You can join us in the Discord, of course. Link in the podcast description. It's free to join, as always. Again, go listen to the episodes from this past week. Go listen to last Friday's episode with Big V, where we talked about the BBQ trio and its viability long term. Uh, lots of big picture, 10,000 foot view stuff of the team lately and uh we'll continue that going into next week as we keep on looking ahead to the new season to come we probably have some fun dumb stuff coming up too, some stupid little games etc cetera, etc cetera, that get us through the rest of august but uh in the meantime thank you so much for rocking with the show follow subscribe rate review tell a friend join us on youtube all the nine yards 10 yards whatever uh the saying is i forget it uh and nine. we'll have uh what was that i think it's nine I think it is nine. Yeah, uh, I was. I'm thinking about the the Matthew Perry Bruce Willis vehicles. Uh, I think it was the whole nine yards, and then the sequel was the whole ten yards. Uh, oh. These were not good movies. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we'll be back uh, next week. Have yourselves a wonderful weekend, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks for hanging. Bye bye. I hit the ceiling. I'm a disaster. <laughs>